What's up everyone and welcome back to the channel. That is it, the last song have been performed in Churin and about now the stage in the Paralympico has probably been taken down already. Those things happen quite quickly, it takes weeks to build a stage and then you just like demolish it in the evening or whatever. It's been a few days now since we've had the grand final of the Eurovision 2022 and I thought now is a good time where I've just kind of like gathered my thoughts, I have some things I want to say. Let's, let's wrap up the contest, let's wrap up this year of Eurovision. I hope everyone had a, a fantastic Eurovision evening and I hope you had a great party, whether you just celebrated on your own, with a partner, with family or maybe even with some friends. Personally, I had a great evening with some of my best friends. We we celebrated, we drank, we had fun. I think it was honestly quite an exciting year, even though it all kind of panned out how we expected in the end. I still think it was very exciting to watch this year. And I did originally say in my semi-final thoughts video that I was going to do a wrap up on Sunday, but I wasn't exactly ready to talk about anything Sunday. Came home very late, was very tired and... Yeah, I don't have anything else to say. We're doing it now. This is going to be, it's going to be totally unscripted. There's not going to be like a coherent theme or anything in this video. Let's just talk a little bit about what happened, what I thought about the show, what I thought about the results, because I think the results are so interesting this year and there are lots of fun things to talk about. I don't think there's any point in rambling anymore. Of course, you all know it by now, the winner of the Eurovision 2022 is Ukraine's Kalish Orchestra and... In my original recording the other day, I really feel like I stumbled over my words when I talked about this victory, so instead I'm just gonna do a little insert and I'm gonna do it quick. Basically, how I view this victory is that I think they 100% deserve it, and I don't agree with people saying that this was just a sympathy vote. At the end of the day, we don't know how many, if any, voted of the song based on sympathy or if they liked the song. So really, the conversation doesn't matter. Personally, I think Stephanie is one hell of a bub. I've loved this song from the beginning. I think it's it's so cool, it's so fresh, it's so modern, and I just think it's it's amazing that despite everything going on, we've actually had Ukraine take part in Eurovision this year. I don't think anyone really expected it, myself included. And I will say, you know, going into this, I wasn't one of those who said that, oh, Ukraine's going to win for sure, so this is going to be boring to watch the announcement. Because at the end of the day, we didn't know, we hadn't seen anything in Eurovision in the past that would indicate that this sympathy vote would be a thing, so I didn't agree with that at all. But hey, they absolutely landslided the televote, and you cannot just do that by sympathy votes alone, I don't believe so at least. And the song is doing relatively well on streaming here after the contest too. So it's like, I just think it's a boring and stupid and pointless conversation that I don't think we need to be having. Instead, we have the winners now, so let us congratulate them. Because being angry, annoyed or whatever, that's not going to change the result. Nothing's going to change the result. So why bother? It may not be your favorite song. And hey, there's definitely been songs in the past that has won Eurovision that I haven't been a fan of. But so be it. That's just how it is with Eurovision. And, you know, even with the songs that I don't necessarily really love, you know, I still congratulate the winner because people voted for it. So that's why it's the winner. And they won the televote. And I always believe, you know, if someone wins the televote, they are deserving of the win. So that's the same this year as well. And now back to my original recording. And I think it's so cool that we have a rep winner of Eurovision. It's something we've never had. And I feel like, especially here in the last couple of years, and we really saw it last year, the progressiveness of Eurovision, the fact that we're getting back to the Eurovision that I grew up with, the Eurovision where interesting songs win, where it isn't just a perfect Swedish polished pub. I use that term so often, I do apologize to the Swedes for that, because it's not your fault, but I feel like there has just been some years 
where Eurovision has just been kind of boring. You don't really remember the winners because it's just these very these songs that are put into these very specific boxes where I feel like if you look at the televoting from last year and from this year, you really notice people are voting for different. People are voting for authentic and people are voting for cool. And I love that about it. And honestly, I would love to see countries try to mimic the style and the coolness that Kalos Orchestra have, because I think it could be such an interesting Eurovision next year if we have more of this kinds of stuff. I get that there are some people who didn't grow up in the weird era of Eurovision, like in the beginning of, uh, of the new millennium, but I personally did, and it was one of the reasons why I fell in love with Eurovision, why I'm sitting here today. So I love seeing these songs, and we're not only talking about Stefania here, we're also talking about Incopresano from Serbia, for example. I love the fact that that song was able to get into that top five thanks to the televote, because it's such an interesting song, and I don't think I fully understood that song before we actually got to the final, and I really, you know, really sat down, I listened to what the commentators were talking about, like what this song truly means. I did a whole video about doing statements right at Eurovision, and I think, I don't necessarily know if this is doing statements right, because I think the statement is lost on so many people. But on the other side, I think that the people that it matters for, the Serbian people, you know, who voted this song into Eurovision, I think the message came across there, and I think it was able to win for the same reasons that Eat Your Salad was able to win. It's an interesting song with an interesting message, and I do think a lot of the televoting comes from people who are really invested in the song, hear the song, see the performance, want to know what's going on, and they go and look it up and they actually find out that there is a really interesting and important story behind this. It's not just someone being weird and washing their hands on stage. But going back to Ukraine, of course, the question now uh, comes up, and it's the thing we're going to be talking about for quite a while, I can imagine. It's going to be the big talk in the Eurovision community over the summer, and that is, of course, where is Eurovision 2023 going to be held? Personally, I don't think it's going to be held in Ukraine, but I also said that I personally didn't believe that they, were, they would be able to win this year, so maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. But I just don't see a possibility of Eurovision being held in Ukraine. And that doesn't have anything to do with looking a year ahead, because frankly, none of us know how things are going to look in Ukraine in a year. So that's not really what I'm talking about. The reason that I see it as being close to impossible is the fact that Eurovision is a production that takes a hell of a time to make and you have to basically from the day that you win Eurovision is the day the preparations begin and I just don't think that the broadcaster is able to put in the time and the money that they need to get started on planning Eurovision right at this moment. Personally, I could see a situation where uh, the Ukrainian broadcaster would work together with someone like the Polish broadcaster or the German broadcaster. Those would be my two personal picks. Of course, there are others in contention and there's already talks about that, but those would be the two that I think would make the most sense, either one of them, like having it in Poland, for example, in an arena close to the Ukrainian border, I think that would be great. I think Germany, like I said, is also a, a good place to be able to hold it. I want Ukraine to be involved with it. I want, you know, Ukrainian host for the show. I want Timur back. That's that's basically what I'm saying. I, I love that guy. And, you know, he's been two times junior Eurovision host, one time Eurovision host. So he really is in that, like, special group of very few people who have been presenting at a Eurovision event multiple times. And I would just love to see him back on that stage because he is Ukrainian at Eurovision, for me at least. I could really see something beautiful being built there by, you know, having a broadcaster who's able to finance it, but is also willing to make a show that's very much drenched in Ukrainian culture, and you really get to learn about the country, and you maybe get to learn about some of the, the cities that we as Western people have been able to learn about throughout this war, and, you know, we've mainly heard the bad stuff, of course, it would be a great platform to really show off these beautiful places and show them being rebuilt. It really tells a story of, of Europe uniting. There's really a possibility here to tell a beautiful story about, you know, the power that Europe has and the power that we have when we stand together. Because that's what Eurovision is for. That's what Eurovision was built for all the way back in the day, you know, to unite the continent after a horrible war. And Eurovision next year 
can hopefully be a show that once again unites Europe after a horrible war. So I don't think it's gonna be in Ukraine. I just don't think that's gonna be possible, but I do want them to have some sort of involvement in next year's show. I think that's so important. But that was, of course, the winner, but that's not the only interesting thing. Like I said, I think the results are so cool this year. It was such a nerve-wracking final in that voting segment. And I think really, you know, the jury votes coming in and seeing something we haven't seen for years, UK up at the top of the scoreboard. Like, I'm not even a Brit. And I felt that. I felt that deep within me. And, you know, I feel like there is this thing in the community. And maybe I just feel it extra strongly because I've been part of the UK community a little bit, at least, thanks to being part of ESC Fans TV. But there's really just been a will this year for the UK to do well because they've finally done something. They've finally come with a song that people could get behind. And I think we're all just wishing for them to do well because... Sam is fantastic, the song is fantastic, and I really truly believe that Spaceman can have a life outside of Eurovision as well, and I feel like it already has that, because it's been played on BBC Radio 1 even before it was announced as the song going to Eurovision. This song, I feel like, can absolutely have a life on its own, and Sam is an artist up and coming, really there where he's like, he's just about to take off, I feel like, with his career. And this second place at Eurovision, I think, will just help him. You know, he's going on tour here later in the autumn, and I really want to go to his concert because he is coming to Copenhagen. But it's like just a few days after I go to Duncan Lawrence's concert, and getting from where I live to Copenhagen, it's not difficult, but it's a bit annoying. <laughs> I haven't figured out yet if I want to go, but I am definitely considering it because he is a proper artist. And I think that really is what makes the difference because you could put someone else in his spot singing Spaceman and it probably wouldn't have been the same because the thing is what makes Spaceman great and what makes the performance great, even though I personally wasn't a big fan of the live performance, but we'll get back to that. But what makes this great is just the whole package, you know? Sam Ryder being an actual artist, an actual performer, someone with an artistic identity who knows what he wants to do and who just shines professionalism at the same time as just having the time of his life on that stage. I think it absolutely sells the song. I couldn't imagine a better ambassador, not only for this song, but for UK at the Eurovision, as a whole, other than this guy, he is a fantastic. I did mention it there, I wasn't a big fan of his performance. Personally, I felt like, you know, I think his vocals were great, he was on point, but I don't like the little vocal exercises that he has to throw in there. In general, artists who do that, I'm just not a big fan of that, really. And I didn't get the guitar solo, I know a lot of people love that, but it was just... It was, a, it was a little bit too kitsch, I feel like, but then again, it is the UK, you kind of have to have just a little sprinkle of kitsch in there, right? But hey, it won over the juries for sure, and he did all right with the public televote as well. I think in a world where, you know, the things going on in Ukraine wasn't going on, I think we would absolutely be going to the United Kingdom next year, which is weird to say, because the last time they won was in 1997. I'm born in 1997, so I've never been able to, the time that I've been a Eurovision fan, I've never been able to experience the glory days of the United Kingdom. I've never seen them as a country, you know, ascending quality acts. So it's, it's fun to be in this position now where hopefully they can turn this around. And the same for Spain. I mean, both Spain and the UK have gotten their best result since the 90s, and that's amazing. And I think Chanel, once again, born performer, Absolutely no doubt about it. And the fact that this is her first single, like you, you cannot tell that at all. You can tell that, you know, she's been a professional dancer for years and she knows how to work a camera. She knows how to work a stage. And, you know, her vocals sounded great despite all the dancing she has to do. Absolutely the right winner of Benidorm Fest. Gonna get some Spanish people after me, possibly after saying that. But I think she was the right winner. And I think absolutely deserve that she got a third place in this contest. But it's going to be so interesting to see, right, what's gonna happen now. Because the thing is, because now they've done it, both Spain and the United Kingdom have done it. They've managed to secure themselves a top three finish. But you have to build on that, right? And I do fear, especially with the United Kingdom, if they send something next year that doesn't land the same way that Spaceman did, and they aren't able to get another top 10 result, maybe just like finishing somewhere like 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th in the final, 
I'm just very afraid that the public perception will once again be like, oh, this was just a one-time thing. It was only because of same writer. We're just never going to do well again unless we just keep sending him or whatever. Like, you have to build upon these things and you have to look at what you did right this time, try to analyze that and figure out, okay, so how can we continue to the, do that moving forward while also not being too disappointed if it doesn't hit the first time? Look at someone like the Netherlands, for example, you know, they had their breakout with a nuke and then the year after we have Calm After the Storm, coming second, they're riding on a wave here, you know, it really feels like now we're doing something. And then they didn't qualify in 2015. But that didn't, they didn't let it get them down, you know, the Netherlands, they, they kept trying, they kept using this formula, trying to get artists who were authentic, who really wanted to do it. And in the end, they got a win with Duncan Lawrence. And I think 100% the United Kingdom, BBC and Tap Music, they can do the same if they just put in the right mindset to it and really say, okay, we've cracked the code. We sort of know now what we're supposed to do to get that top three finish. Now let's try to build upon that. And eventually, if we keep going at it, we will get that win. I hope it for them at least. And I hope it for Spain as well. I mean, it's been way, way longer for Spain since their last victory compared to the United Kingdom. So I, I really do want them to do well as well. And I do think Betty Dormfest is coming back next year and I really do hope that we get as many established acts and interesting acts in Benidorm next year because I think again, just like with the United Kingdom, I, I feel like they found a formula here that's really cool and I think they can build upon it and they can absolutely secure that victory at some point. It'll be very interesting to see. There's so many other songs I could talk about, but this is once again going to be a 20 minute video. And it's not that I hate doing 20 minute videos, but I always just, I'm always scared that people aren't interested in watching that long of an analysis. Let me know down in the comments what you think. Do you want videos to be longer or shorter? I could have just as well done this as a live stream, I feel like, because I have so many things to say. And there are so many other, like, performances I could talk about. Some of the things I've already kind of talked about in the semi-final video, I've always already talked about the hosts. I really love those. Again, love the very Italian touch uh, in the final there. I loved uh, Mika's performance. I think his medley was great. It was weird we didn't get last year's winner song being performed. Maybe it was supposed to happen, but like I feel like I've heard something about that the lead singer of Moneskin uh, was injured, so him just being there on stage was a miracle. Like people weren't sure if he was actually going to be there, so it was nice hearing their new song. I think it's cool. I like that. But a little weird we didn't get to hear uh, last year's winner song, I feel like. But let me just end it off uh, with something here, because like I said, there's so many other songs. I have the scoreboard over here. Very sad for Germany. Germany was really one of my favorites. Very sad for that. But also very happy with Portugal finishing in the top 10. I think Portugal is really is stepping up and who knows, maybe they'll be in for their second win in a few years time. Can't believe I'm saying that considering what Portugal used to be, but I do think they're building towards that. You know, they just need to get the public involved as well. But I think they're just, they are really a country that's really good at doing these like beautiful songs full of soul in them and I love them for it. But I want to end off talking about Denmark. We have the split results now and we know that my country Denmark finished in 13th place in the semi-final. It's higher than I expected. I expected around 15th because I just didn't... I didn't believe that this song was really going to land with anyone, but 13th place, I mean, it could be worse. We could be last in the semi-final, but I think, you know, so many things have already been said. I did actually try to film a video talking about uh, the response from the Danish head of uh, Melodie Grand Prix. I tried to do a video responding to some of the things that he has said to a DR that was on like a little article on their website. The video didn't make a lot of sense, so I didn't post it in the end, but I think like me as well as so many other Danish fans have really been shouting out Denmark both last year and this year. And I mean, I made a whole video about it as well when the songs were released originally. Like we're angry. I feel like a lot of, I don't know if I'm necessarily angry. I'm not someone who really gets angry about that kind of stuff, but there are a lot of people who are really annoyed by the way DR are tackling it. And you know, I've just gotten to a point where I'm just starting to think maybe we aren't going to get change. Maybe this is just how it's going to be for the next couple of years. And if we keep doing Dance Multi Grand Prix the way we are now, I just don't think we're going to be qualifying for the next couple of years. 
And that's really sad. And it, it sucks when you're at that point where you almost forget that your own country participates, which is what I feel like happened to me this year because I just, I didn't give many, you know, this sounds so harsh, but I didn't really give many fucks about the show. It wasn't a song I really cared about. And I just didn't really care what placing we were going to get. And sometimes I almost forgot we were even participating. So I'm not going to get into that rant again, because I feel like, you know, I could do another video about it. And maybe I will at some point talking about what I think DR should do to get back into the swing of things. But at the same time, it feels like, you know, so many of us are doing videos, articles, all of these things about what we think should be improved. But, you know, from what you kind of read between the lines of, of what the, the boss of Multi Grand Prix in Denmark is saying, it feels like he doesn't really care. Like, it, it feels like what the fans want the show to be and what he wants the show to be, two completely different things. And I feel like we're just not going to be able to meet there in the middle and actually make something that, you know, can work for your vision as well and not just be something who's played on that, like, one Danish radio station that only people over 40 listen to. But I digress. I don't want to get into that rant again. One thing I just want to end off the video by saying, because I wanted to mention it earlier and forgot, is that I think Eurovision gets a lot more fun when you don't see the results, the winner being the most important thing. And that's not saying that, you know, you shouldn't get excited about the results, your favorites doing well. Of course, I was nervous and excited to see how Sweden, my favorite, was going to be doing this year. And of course, you know, it's one of the most exciting parts of the show that is seeing that voting sequence, seeing how people are going to end up on the scoreboard. But like, I don't hate the contest or get annoyed if my favorite doesn't win. I don't feel like my perception at all when it comes to Eurovision has changed because Ukraine won. No matter what people are going to say about, you know, if they deserve the win or not, which again, like I said, I think they deserved it, but... I've just seen people who just seems like they don't care about the contest because politics won. And it's like, yes, it's a part of the game. It's a part of, of the show that we have, you know, a winner at the end and we have a, you know, a winner hosting the contest next year. But like, that's not the main reason why I watch Eurovision. I engage with this contest because I love discovering new artists and new music. I love to geek out over this like big production. No television production, in my opinion, comes close to this. Maybe the Olympics, but that's about it. You know, in, in terms of, of all these innovative things that happens in the production, how well produced some of these shows are, how interesting they can be. There are so many parts about Eurovision, the culture as well. So many things that I love about Eurovision and that makes me love Eurovision that even, you know, if a politics was the only thing determining the winner for the next five years, it wouldn't change my perception on Eurovision. Yes, it may suck a little, but I don't really care because I think Eurovision is so much more than that. And I think we need to remember that sometimes. That's all I want to say. It's been exciting. And that's kind of the end of the 2022 season. And we now look forward to 2023 at some point when we figure out where it's like going to be hosted and all that. I feel like at, at the moment with my channel here in Ian Pavilion, because obviously I haven't been here right from like the first uh, of the national finals, but I've been here for most of, of this season, I feel like. But in my opinion, Neon Pavilion at, the, at this moment is kind of like in its season zero. And I feel like it's going to be that like over the course of the summer as well, because I'm still very much trying to figure out what do I really want to do with this channel? Where do I, what direction do I want to take my content in? I definitely like doing these things where I don't just talk about the songs, but I also talk about the production and just geek out a little bit more because that is what I'm interested in. I don't do reaction videos. I don't do song reviews. That's not what I'm here for. So I do have some other kinds of series and some interesting stuff that I hope to be doing over the summer. So definitely click that subscribe button down there if you want to see more of that. But still trying to figure out like what I want to do, especially like in the in season, because I feel like I've really struggled figuring out what kind of content I wanted to do over national final season, but also in the build up to the Eurovision this year. But we'll see what happens next year, I suppose. Thank you for watching this video. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like and subscribe down below, like I said. Hope you had a fantastic Eurovision 2022 as well. Leave your favorite moments down in the comments below if you want to. And yeah, I'll hopefully see you guys very soon.